everyone. Welcome to Health Impact Live Digital Health Talks. This is Megan Antonelli, your host, and I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Divya Bhatt, the newly appointed Chief Product Officer at Memora Health. Divya brings a wealth of experience as a serial entrepreneur and product leader with an impressive track record at companies like uh, Verta Health, DoorDash, Expedia, and Trulia. I was, we were talking earlier about how, you know, it's like a list of all the companies that are fixing, fixing San Francisco. But anyway, her expertise in leveraging technology to so- solve complex problems makes her a perfect speaker for today's topic, revolutionizing patient care, the power of intelligent conversational AI. Divya's perspective on applying lessons from diverse industries to healthcare promises to offer valuable insights into the future of patient engagement and care continuity. Hi, Divya. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? I am great. Thanks for having me, Megan. Absolutely. Well, it's great to connect with you, and I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing um, at Memora. So tell us a little bit about you know, wh- how what Memora does and how its approach to conversational AI is different from some of the traditional patient engagement tools. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to be here, um, both on this podcast, but also at Memora. Uh, I'm still, you know, new enough. I'm um, four months in um, and just super energized about Memora's unique approach. Um, So if it sounds like I've drank the Kool-Aid, I have. (laughs) Um, So that's like where I'm coming from here. Um, Memora has an SMS first approach to automating complex care journeys. And so we're really trying to get into the heart of patient and care team communications, parts of the patient care journey that are really complex, where patients are navigating something maybe they haven't navigated before, something where they may have a lot of questions, something where a care team never feels like they can do enough to bring the patient along. This is where we insert our SMS-based care programs to give care teams superpowers, right? So it's more than a patient engagement platform. It's really a full scaffold around the patient, clinician, care team communication that can give everyone kind of superpowers and the leverage that AI can. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. We've really been talking about that a lot lately, you know, where you, on one hand, you're hearing a lot of people that are sort of, you know, concerned about AI and certainly, you know, will it take jobs or will it do this? But, but you know, what we're hearing more and more from the innovators and from the hospitals of what they're using it for and what they want is for that technology to amplify the work that they're able to do or the work that they weren't able to do, to do things that they, you know, really weren't able to cover and and provide more structure and, and certainly more, more contact with patients. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, can you share some examples of that, of where, you know, what are the clinical areas that that it really is, is working in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we've launched care programs a whole, a, across a whole lot of different clinical areas. We have um, a bunch of oncology programs, both for people going through chemo, people recovering from um, surgical oncology um, or oncology surgeries. And we have postpartum programs. We have endoscopy prep programs. Um, we have transitions of care programs for people who are being discharged from the emergency room. Um, So all of these programs where patients might just have questions, right? Like they're going through this for the first time, they're going through something hard, they're going through something complicated, and patients and care team members kind of don't have peace of mind, right? Like there's this underlying stress. Um, And so we are there to ease the stress on both sides. And to your point, Megan, um, we're not trying to replace the care team member. Like we don't believe that that's the goal. We don't think that's the right thing to do. Um, but there are certain things, as we know, that AI and that computers can actually do better than a person, right? We're not trying to drive top of license care. Like we would like the providers and the clinicians and the care team members to focus on top of license care. Here are the things that AI can do better, right? Like we can be always on right? A a human, it's not reasonable for them to be always on. Um, And we can be infinitely personalized, right? So EHRs right now are like, you know, we're sitting on these mountains of patient data, but it's very hard for a human in the moment to actually get a sense of everything that's going on with a patient and give like a, you know, uniquely personalized answer. These are the things that AI can kind of support care teams in doing, right? They can give the patient a timely personalized response, can triage, we can answer 
you know, the quote unquote easy questions, which, you know, are easy for a clinician, maybe not so easy for the patient. And then we can also provide that important escalation point um, so that if the patient actually does need top of license care and they need the clinician intervention or the care team intervention, um, they can get that. So um, I'm happy to go into examples, happy to talk more about the approach. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I mean, just also those different care um, you know, points of care, you know, whereas, you know, sometimes some of the routines like, like colonoscopy or, you know, even postpartum, you know, it's your, that level of, you know, you, you hear it, you know, it, it, you know, certainly after you've had a few or gone through it a couple of times, but then you do end up having questions. So you want to go back and it's not necessarily at the point where you, you know, you've, you've gotten the appointment or you've, you've talked to the caregiver, but to, so to be able to have that, but then it sounds like you're also doing it. It's a more complex, you know, I mean, oncology is, is more complex. Of course, the stress that people are going through at that time often makes it so that when the provider communicates with them, they don't necessarily hear what they're saying. So it's good to have that resource too. So tell us a little bit about, you know, if, if you can kind of, um, you know, how you're doing that with some of the more complex care pathways and, and stuff with like oncology and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for oncology in particular, you know, if we, we have recent partnerships with um, Intermountain Health, Eisenhower Health, um, a few others where we have oncology programs in place. Um, I just looked before this, we have exchanged over 300,000 messages with patients in these oncology care programs. And we know that only 5% of those messages escalated to a care team member. So this means 95% of those 300,000 messages are something that our AI was able to handle. We were able to kind of address the patient's question. And this could be around medication. It could be around lifestyle. It could be around rescheduling an appointment. Like there's so many things that someone going through an oncology program may have questions about that don't, you know, require a nurse to pick up the phone and answer. But, um, you know, memoras, like one of the things that we do very uniquely is we deeply integrate into the care team workflows. We integrate into the EHR. We integrate into the, you know, epic in basket um, that the care teams have. Um, and so we have that information, like we have the appointment data, you know, we know when they're starting chemo or if it's a surgery program, we know when the surgery is, we know their discharge date. So we can be very tailored um, with the, um, which is with our programs, right? So we can do check-ins, we can check in on their symptoms, we can do a little bit of symptoms triage, we can decide whether or not we want to recommend home care, um, you know, based on what the symptom is, um, you know, nausea, things like that, versus something that needs to escalate to a care team, you know, things like shortness of breath, like we want to make sure to escalate, but a patient doesn't know, they don't know when they need to call in and when they don't. Um, so, you know, this applies across a lot of our programs, but to your point, like going through a cancer treatment is a very stressful time. And there's a lot of questions coming up, some of which are time sensitive, some of which aren't in that time of stress, it's hard for a patient to know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try to be this layer um, between the care team and the patient to give everyone peace of mind. And just to clarify, what's the platform? Is it on their phone? Is it on the computer? Is it yeah, it's all SMS based? So we try to make patients where they oh, are. Right. Um, we don't want them to have to download an additional app. So for the patient, it's SMS. Um, and then for Got the it. care team, we integrate uh, with their EHR and with their workflow. So no one has to download anything new, which um, I'm a <laughs> strong believer in, in healthcare. Downloading new things is, um, it's, it's a barrier. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, that, you know, I, as I mentioned in the intro, I mean, I, your background is so interesting to me. I, I, you know, I think, um, healthcare has for a long time tried and wanted to learn from more customer facing, you know, customer centric, uh, technologies and and sectors. And so coming from, you know, DoorDash and Expedia, so travel and transportation, how has some of that shaped how you're looking at, you know, the products and the programs that you guys are are launching? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think about this a lot. Um, so, you know, I've, you kind of um, listed like the, the companies that I've worked at. One common theme is a lot of these companies really changed the way kind of slow entrenched industries operated. Um, and in every single one of those journeys, at some point it felt impossible, right? And I know a lot of folks feel this way about healthcare. We feel like it's this, you know, 
industry that has so much kind of inertia and it's it's hard to change. And so I think I've just, I've seen it. Like, I think I have this optimism now knowing that like there is a path forward. You know, when I started at Expedia, people were still using travel agents and printing out or like getting mailed those, you know, like those boarding passes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was at, when I was at Trulia, I was brought on to start and run the Trulia rentals team. It was like a, a new um arm within Trulia. At the time, everyone was just using Craigslist like the, or, or walking around a neighborhood and just like calling or writing down phone numbers for those for rent signs. Um, it did not- I was there doing that. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's so funny because it, you know, living in San Francisco at the time that I did, you know, that was exactly, you know, it was like, uh, DoorDash, there was nothing delivered. You couldn't get taxis. It was, you know, and then travel was travel, and then rentals were a mess, you know. And there was just you know for rent signs that you'd have to go find. So yeah, um, thank you, Divya. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just me; it was me with large team of highly qualified people. Um, but I think even just seeing there, you know, I mean, Expedia was my first job out of college, so I don't get credit for it. But I think just being a fly on the wall in that journey, I think it gives me. And I think also being a founder, I think I have some of that like founder optimism that you just kind of need to push forward in these tough industries. Um, But I mean, I think my point is these industries didn't seem like they could change and they did. They have changed, right? Like the way we interact as consumers is really different. I think my other kind of perspective that I bring from being both in healthcare for the last few years, but not in healthcare prior is I think patients deserve a healthcare technology experience that they're experiencing in all the other parts of their lives, right? Like I think that right now, some of us accept this double standard of like, well, like, you know, in your non-healthcare apps, there's this like high level of user experience and polish. And then, you know, when you're texting with your health system, like we accept a lower bar. Um, I don't think we have to do that. And I don't think we're meeting the expectations of patients or clinicians, right? Like care teams, they are also using other apps outside of their jobs. And so then they go to work and they're using, you know, Epic or whatever it is, like it causes some some friction. It's adding to the sense of burnout. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think just having high standards for user experience and for technology experiences um, and bringing, you know, those standards from other industries into healthcare, it, it, it might be overly ambitious. Um, but I, no, know. I think it's, I mean, I think it's right on point. And I think, um, you know, I, and I do think we're seeing it across the board and, and certainly with, you know, um, you know, one medical and other, you know, the sort of direct patient care models that, you know, patients are demanding it. Um, and, and certainly the you know younger patients expect it. Um, and, and it should be seamless, both for the provider, right. And for, for the patient. Um, but of course there's also reasons behind why it has been slower to make it as user-friendly, right. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges that you guys are facing or that you're seeing around, you know, how to, you know, the technology's there, right. We know that in our banking account, you know, there's security, there's privacy, not that it's 100% all the time, but for the most part, we we rely on it, we count on it. And, you know, our money stays where it's supposed to. And, you know, and, 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 and the experience is good. And we can get it no matter what country we're in, no matter where we are. Um, healthcare is not quite there yet. Um, but we know the technology is there. Tell us a little bit about what you guys are seeing and how you're how you're coming to some of those challenges and and overcoming them. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, bear with me. I'm going to give a complicated answer to this. I promise I'll tie it all back together. This is such a complicated question, um, but feel free to pull me back. <laughs> this is like, um, but I think there's a couple of things here. I think one is you know the challenge is exactly what you said. Healthcare is really unique. Like when we're talking about patient health, we need to take extreme care. Um, You know, we can't be flippant. We can't make, you know, the sort of mistakes you could make if you're just trying to, I don't want to say just, but like trying to coordinate friends meeting up, like the stakes are higher, right? So we need to take care. We need to be thoughtful about patient safety. We need to think about access. We need to think about health equity. We need to think about bias. Right. There's all of these things that are they exist in our healthcare system and technology has the ability to make it better or worse. And I think it's very easy to fall on the wrong side of that if we're not extremely careful. But I do want to emphasize that healthcare act or technology 
has the ability to make these things better also we can do better than just, you know, an individual overworked human at some of these things. You know, we have better data, right? We can actually improve safety and access and equity and bias if we're doing it thoughtfully. Um, so I think there's an opportunity, but it's, it's, it's both sides. Like we can't screw it up, but we can make it better, but we can't screw it up, but we can make it better. Like we got, we've got to balance that. Um, so I think our approach um, has been around building on the trust that a patient and a care team inherently have. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that's unique about healthcare because of all this complexity around safety and the importance of someone's health and the stress that they're going through, that trust is has to be central. Right. Like we can't, I don't want to replace it. I don't want to say like you're going to talk to your care team, but also trust us. We're Memora and we're going to do this other thing for you. Like we need to build around that. Um, and, you know, I think we have people across America right now that are struggling with their healthcare journeys in so many different ways. Um, there's communities that are getting forgotten and they're getting left behind. Um, there is a lot of, you know, like healing and trust that needs to happen. And I think our care teams that are on the ground are doing that work right now. Mm -hmm. So we want to build on that. Like, we don't want to like circumvent it. We don't want to go around it. We want to work through it. Um, and this is where we are really aiming to focus on helping those care teams build that trust and deliver the best care they can at the top of their license. We want to help them feel less burned out. We want to help them feel unburdened, like unburdened. We want to help them feel like Memora is taking work off of their plates in a way that they can trust so they can focus on other things. And so we are still using that core trust and we're also using that care team to help ensure, you know, that patients are feeling comfortable with the safety and the security and all that other stuff. And we're, like I said, kind of providing those superpowers and that scaffolding around the care teams mm -hmm. um, instead of replacing it. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about, you know, when you work with a health system to kind of, you know, are you going in saying, hey, we've got this oncology tool or or, or are you working, you know, going to the customer or the, the hospital and saying, where do you think this is needed? How can we build for you? Tell us a little bit about what that's looking like for you guys in terms of um, the process. And then also even just like who in the organization is the person who you're finding is the most, you know, receptive and, and um you know, interested in this stuff? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so we have a handful of care programs that are tried and true um, that we have seen work. Um, and, you know, we're happy to lead with those. Um, based on some of the things we are good at, those same core competencies can easily apply to other departments as well. You know, we're good at appointment preparedness, like I was saying with our um, colonoscopy prep programs. We have a 97% response rate for patients saying, I have completed the prep and I'm ready for my appointment. So that, um, sure, from one clinical area to the next, like the specifics may vary, but appointment preparedness is something we're good at. So, you know, we will go and say, you know, we have these GI programs, they're very effective, but at a specific health system, they may have a particular department that's maybe more or less open to a technology solution at that point. We are happy to work with them and kind of apply some of those learnings. You know, we're not flying blind. Um, these same principles apply. Um, so, you know, there, there are other areas that we have done appointment preparedness in. We're looking at allergy testing as one of them, making sure people don't eat the, you know, foods or take the meds they need to prior to showing up for allergy testing. Um, so we so have it comes to, oh, sorry. No, no, no. no. But yeah, when it comes to the appointment preparedness, like uh, when they, you know, I mean, because hospitals are so strapped and they, they while they want to be innovative and they want to be adopting these technologies, I think you have to go in with that sort of, you know, this is where we're going to either save you money, save you time, really improve patient, you know, experience in, in that way. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, appointment preparedness, I also would imagine means less missed appointments. Are there any, have you guys done research around that? Do you have um, a sense of that, that value paradigm? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the value driver. That is our ROI value story around appointment preparedness. We reduce no-shows. We also reduce the number of people that show up unprepared um, and can't complete, you know, the appointment. And so we're increasing throughput, um, utilization. Uh, we should be driving top-line revenue. 
Um, and there's the operational efficiency of all of that work that went into getting that patient there. That's work that someone on the care team might have otherwise either done or maybe didn't have the time to do. Right. So there's the kind of that bottom line and the operational efficiency and the like the care team reach that we're providing, but then driving those outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So with that, around the provider communication, like I, you know, your sort of your purview is product. I imagine that means going in and kind of saying, okay, this is an area where there's a need. How do you then, you know, if you're working, I assume with the, the clinicians, you're building off of that trust. So you've got to kind of understand what does that normal communication look like? What does the ideal communication look like? How are you guys getting to that in terms of your, um, you know, product development stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, we um, are in a fortunate position where I think we can lead with perspective, right? We have care programs deployed across a variety of health systems. We're always learning from them. And I think we can bring some best practices with us. You know, we have the care programs where we can say, well, here's what works. Um, here's what we do well. But we also know that every health system has some unique flavors and maybe they're working with a different community. Maybe they do things a little bit differently. Maybe their care team members are from a different community, right? So we do, um, you know, we're selling enterprise deals. So this isn't necessarily an out of the box solution. We know that we need to make sure we're meeting the unique needs of our health system partners. So we do, you know, clinical scoping. We work with the care teams to say, you know, what are you doing right now? Um, how is what we're doing aligned with what you're doing right now? We make sure the messaging is aligned. Um, we can, you know, add or remove many of these components and, you know, we can kind of have a back and forth where it's, you know, we've seen this work, but we also want it to align with what the health system might be doing. Mm -hmm. Am I answering the right question? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, when I think about sort of how the expectation of colonoscopy prep, it, you know, would be very routine, right? The questions would be all the same, the responses. Yeah, Whereas are the ex It's like, did you pick up your prep today? You know, your four days before right. do you what you need to do? Have you, have you had it? You know, did you right. know that dietary? Yeah. So it's, and, you know, and certainly, but then on the other side of things where, um, you know, with oncology, you know, are you finding that, you know, they're, things get escalated more often that you have to have sort of that, that more sensitivity to where the care team needs to get involved and how, yeah, I guess, how do you balance those two, those two types of um, pathways? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we do have a lot of, we have the ability to configure and especially things like you're talking about. I mean, I think the size of the care team can really change some of that. You know, some folks have a dedicated care manager and they want all the alerts and they want that person to see them. Other folks are like, you know what, we're a smaller team feel free to handle these and just escalate. So we can customize that things at that level. And so again, I think we can lead with perspective, we can share what's worked, but we also wanna be very clear that we wanna learn from our customers as well, what's worked for them in their system and their population. Um, and so we have a lot, yeah, the configurability is there um, and we just try to deploy it at the right times to have the best impact. Awesome. And then around, you know, what you're looking at for the future. So you're, you're in these, are you looking to expand the care or is it more regional? What's your, you know, what's the sort of pathway for, for you guys in terms of the future, but also where do you see um, this headed? Cause I think, you know, we've seen such a, you know, sort of very fast, which is rare for healthcare uh, adoption of this. And certainly the interest level is super high. Where do you see this, this kind of heading in terms of the next, Six months to a few years. Yeah, um, fantastic question. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, we do span quite a few clinical areas right now, and we very quickly can expand to more because, as I was saying, we kind of have these core competencies that um, should have, that, that do apply across a bunch of different areas, right? And so, um, I'll speak for myself. One thing I would love to see, one of the things I'm most excited about is spanning more and more clinical areas across any given health system to kind of help bring cohesion to that patient experience. Because I think right now, um, Memora's programs are very targeted and they're solving a very specific problem really well. And I want to make sure we continue to do that. But I think right now patient experiences can still feel very disjointed, right? They're, they're working with different departments. People have different comorbidities and care team workflows can also differ 
from one department to the next. And so, again, with this care team mindset that we're bringing, right, unburdening the care team, reducing care team burnout, being able to help with that cohesion is something I'd really like for us to be able to do. And so this is part of expanding to more clinical areas, expanding to more clinical areas within our partners, um, I think will help us compound our impact. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're at a phase where I want to balance that. I want to make sure we are really, really doing a good job on the care programs we do have, right? Like, and then I think the second piece is then do a really good job across a few different areas and then think about the compounded impact as we. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, it's like you have the one on the one side, you know, you work in one hospital or you've seen what they always say that you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital, right? And it, you know, and it can even be like, you've seen one department in one hospital, you've seen one department in one hospital, right? So how to make that more uniform? I mean, I, I, I probably a little more often than I should tout what an amazing experience that I've had at Cedars living here in LA. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I have, you know, it's like I, whenever I see someone from Cedars, I'm like, oh my God, it's just the best hospital. It's so great. You know? And they're like, well, not, not, it's not always. <laughs> I'm like, no, really it is. But you know, I've only seen one window of it, but that isn't, you know, I think knowing that organization and then being able to roll out the product and programs within other departments is a, is a really good way to, you know, make that experience uniform throughout. So. Yeah. And I think um, it'll allow us to bring help, health systems bring best practices from department to department, or even just what we're seeing across health systems, you know, like on, on one hand, yeah, like when you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. On the other hand, what's working in our memorial program for patient care often applies broadly. And so, you know, it's like I was, like we were talking about earlier, like we do need to strike that balance between customizing, but also leading with perspective. Because the way our programs are built, we have a unique ability to track and monitor and optimize and see what's working. And so we can help bring this, bring these best practices. Right. And taking those best practices make it actually scalable, right? Mm -hmm. Over customization makes it, you know, hard to scale. So tell us, tell us a little bit about like when you're working um, with those customers or even customers that you haven't yet worked with, but as they're thinking about this journey of, you know, applying conversational AI and AI tools to the clinical um, pathways and to patient experience, what are some of the things that you would say are most important about, you know, implementation or consideration when, when your um, health system partners are getting into it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, this is a question that keeps me up at night, so I have a ready answer. Um, I think integrating deeply into care team workflows and having care team buy-in is the key here. Um, you know, I know that they say... I think I've heard recently, burnout isn't about the amount of work you're doing. It's when you feel like you're doing a lot of work and you're still not having the impact you wish you had, right? It's like that feeling of frustration. Um, we need to be very care team centric and we need kind of buy-in and partnership from, you know, the clinical champions at the partner site to say, like, let's get this right. Let's make sure, you know, the nurses on the floor that are going to be interacting with Memora understand what they're going to be getting from this, what's needed from this, and make sure they are seeing the value. So integrating with Epic, making sure the alerts are happening at the right level, making sure they're seeing the alerts they want to see and not seeing useless alerts, right? So they're not getting alert fatigue, making sure care teams are seeing the value and, you know, capturing the context of everything that's happened in the conversation and making sure it's surfaced to the care team so they can use it. So, you know, there's the patient experience side, which I think is very important, but I don't want to say not rocket science, but it follows many other paths, right? On like best practices. I think this integrating with care teams and understanding care teams and working with their workflows is the part where we're really trying to innovate. And this is where we need the partnership from the health system. So deep integrations. I don't want to say deep training, because I think that if we are doing everything right with our products, we shouldn't need much training and change management, but we need to make sure we're hitting the mark on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's a, the technology should be seamless and invisible, right? In terms of um, the adoption and, and stuff. Yeah. So 
Exactly. Um, that, that is great. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's so much to, to um, sort of absorb and to think about um, what are some of the things that you would kind of leave our audience with in terms of, um, you know, where, where things are headed and, and um, what you're most excited about? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I am very excited to see the value we're driving, um, the cost savings we're driving, but also the kind of top line revenue generation we're driving. And I'm really excited that healthcare in general is at a point where we can actually realize this. You know, we were talking about how it's been just like a little bit lagging, but I think we're at um, an interesting time um, in healthcare. And I think the time is now. Um, because, you know, I think the data is there. It's in the EHRs. I think telemedicine, I think just everything that happened through COVID has gotten patients more accustomed to doing things through technology layers. I think, you know, you mentioned younger folks have those expectations. I would say older folks also have those expectations. You know, everyone's texting with their grandkids like that. That's becoming the norm. Um, and so I think just carefully deploying these technologies, keeping that care team trust at the center of the experience and then expanding from there is um, very exciting. <laughs> Not replacing the kind of augmenting care team superpowers. Um, yeah, no, I love that. I think the, you know, putting trust at the center and augmenting the superpowers of the care team is an amazing sort of mission and vision. And it sounds like you guys are doing a great job with that. So tell our audience how to best get in touch with you if they want to learn more about Memora or more, more, you know, just get in touch with you. If you want to get in touch with me, get in touch with Memora, um, check out our website, memorahealth.com. We have a lot of great content on there. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, would love to connect. And yeah, we're super excited to hear feedback from the market. That's what we thrive on. Um, so yeah, love to yeah. chat. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Divya. It's great to learn about um, both your your experience and what you're bringing to Memora and what Memora is doing. So I'm excited to to watch the success and um, you know what you'll bring to to the organization as well as what they'll bring to their health system partners. So, um, and thank you to our audience. Uh, thanks for joining us for Health Impact Live Digital Health Talks. We hope you found today's conversation informative and inspiring. Don't forget us to join us for the next episode and subscribe to uh, Digital Health Talks podcast. Thank you so much. This is Megan Antonelli.